Hello, everyone. I'm Leono August Rodriguez, the VP of Business Development for Access Medical Labs. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on another Access Live, where we bring you insight from leading medical experts. We do ask that all questions are submitted via the Q&A, as they will be answered at the end of our lecture. Today, we have a very special individual who has been practicing medicine and has been an athlete for over 30 years. To me, he is truly the definition of that saying, practice what you preach. He is the medical director of both On Point Medicine and Total Nutrition Technology. Without further ado, live from North Carolina, Dr. Jerry Ferris. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Good evening, pleasure. everyone, and welcome. Tonight, I really want to kind of take you on a little journey um, as we all go on these journeys of learning about uh, different things. And this is one that the more I delve into it, the more it scares me. But I, what I want to bring you is it more into an awareness of what toxins and where we are, because we every day we see patients and every day we see the same thing. I'm tired. I don't feel well. I'm gaining weight. And we have our bag of tricks and we we do this and we do that and then things don't work and it's like what am i missing right so what i hope to do as i take you on this journey is to now bring you an awareness of something else just to think about okay because not everybody is going to be overwhelmed with toxins but i will tell you we all have some degree of toxin exposure so let's get rolling so i'm pretty simple do I have toxin exposure? I, I could assure you of that. I was a cyclist for years breathing, you know, the gas from cars, you know, and then we're going to talk about detox. So that's me. We'll get going. Toxin exposure. I mean, this can come in many forms. I mean, we know that there's, you know, you read about arsenic and in, in, in rice. That you, we know about lead. There, there's something from the TAC2 study discovered how lead was such a involved in cardiovascular disease, cadmium, mercury. I mean, I'm old enough to know about the mercury thermometers. New areas, everybody's really interested in mold. There's a lot of mold out there. And, but we, we can't forget other things. We, you know, there are natural allergens that can affect us. The, la the other area is pesticides. You know, I, I always talk about we had a big piece of property, and my wife would walk around with two things of Roundup to kill all the weeds. And, and we realize now that glyphosate and some of these insecticides are fat soluble and bind irreversibly, so it can cause problems. We'll get into what are called POPs, or the persistent organic pol pollutants. This is stuff we see every day in our life. Teflon is one of them, flame retardants. And then what are called VOX, which are volatile organics. This is all your solids, fuels, and, and fragrances. And this is very common, especially in cosmetics. Uh, the last area is plastics. We're all familiar with some with BPA. So I won't, we know they're out there. I mean, it, they come in multiple fours forms. It's now, what do we do? You know, wh where is it? This was a very interesting study. This was, the, the CDC last looked at this in 2009, they, and they wanted to know, is there human exposure, right? So we're now 14 years down the road from that. And in 2009, they found 212 chemicals in people's blood and urine, 75 of which had never been measured before. Now, that was a disturbing to me looking at that and I, I, you know, I always ask the question, do you think we're better or worse? I would tell you we have more exposure now than we've ever had in the past. And again, all of these things, we just sort of mentioned them before. This is this, uh, sort of a rehashing of what's there. But I mean, these are things you're exposed to every day. I mean, who doesn't have air fresheners and cleaning products? What woman doesn't use cosmetics? So, I mean, we are exposed, right? Then, you know, you hear about what are xenoestrogens. Those would be foreign substances that can create an estrogenic type response in the body. Xenobiotics is just a term saying it's a foreign substance that can affect the body. And then our old friend glyphosate. Um, if, you've, uh, if you've ever sprayed Roundup, you've had glyphosate. So what do these toxins do? And, I, and again, I don't want to get so deep in the weeds of uh, pathophysiology, but let's let's say they do create oxidative stress. And we all know that's what we're trying to control because too much oxidation leads to free radicals, which leads to inflammation, which leads to disease. I really find it fascinating. They're much more endocrine disruptors than any, that any, any other substances we really come in contact with. 
And now it's starting to affect our genes. So really a big problem. And now I, we work in the world where everybody wants to lose weight, you know, and it can't lose weight. Is this because there is now a problem with dysbiosis? Is there a problem with our enzymes? Nobody's digesting well. Is, is toxicity now a component we haven't considered in this world? So let's just kind of move along. Here are our major chronic disease areas, obesity. I mean, obesity is rampant. I mean, metabolic disease is rampant. Diabetes is rampant. It's every day in our life. I mean, how do these people get there, right? We, we tend to assume it's just overeating and lack of exercise, but I will tell you there are now other factors as you start to consider this that are there. Again, th this, these things can cause vascular disease. They can lead to, obviously lead to cancer. Multiple studies have linked carcinogens to farming areas. I mean, you know, most recently we've had two different trains that went off the track. They had to evacuate everybody. So we know that there's downstream effects of toxic exposure. The things that scares most of us, neurocognitive impairment, and then this whole new world of autoimmunity, which is just epidemic. We've seen more autoimmune disease in the last 20 years than we'd ever seen in a lifetime. And everybody says, well, you're testing for it more. And I would say you are correct with that. But again, this autoimmune thing, this is the body fighting itself. Why are we staying in a chronic immune response syndrome? Why are we doing that? Is there something else there we need to eradicate? So things that, that are common may have other causes that have not been considered. So again, most of this talk is going to be on that idea of toxins, but I would be remiss to not discuss this topic as I did my research in the old whole idea of digital detox. How much, how much exposure do we get to digitalization every day and emails and social media, text, telephones? I mean, I, you drive down the highway and I don't know how these people are driving 80 miles an hour talking and texting. I don't, I'm, I'm not capable of doing such things. But this is another area that, that is, we don't even consider as being toxic, but it can be. So I, I, I would have been remiss to not to complete the whole circle of detoxification in the body. You know, it, it's, it's a, they say most children are logging six to eight hours in front of a screen nowadays. Again, I'm older. I, I didn't do that. So what is digital detox? What is, why do we need to consider it? Mental health issues, really paramount. We've had an explosion in mental health issues in the last post-COVID anxiety, depression. Then we get into the physical health. They're not, they're not getting active. There's weight gain, unhealthy eating habits. This all leads to poor self-esteem, poor self-image. They get in trouble sleeping. They get poor influence. And we all can we, can, we can go ahead and go down the pipe and go, what are the ramifications of this? You know, you get enough stress, something breaks. You know, I, I've worked in an ER for a lifetime. We see more mental health, more suicide, more and more younger people. It's, it's a real problem. So again, I just wanted to bring that up as an aside when we talk about the concept of detoxification. So what about our homes, right? What do, how can we detox our homes? You know, if you've ever bought or sold a home, they check your radon. Radon is very important. It should be checked periodically. I always tell people, grow plants. This is your carbon dioxide to oxygen strain exchange. You should have plants. They're very healthy, right? Use filters when you can. I mean, I live on a farm, so we use, we don't have city water. So again, I need filters because I'm getting groundwater, which we know may be polluted. We need to reduce our plastic exposure. We need to try to shift to more natural products if we can. And then obviously, if you think you have an exposure, please have someone check for mold and asbestos because Mold is more common than you think, especially in older houses. The other area I wanted to talk about is we need to, if we're going to practice functional medicine, and that's what I do now, we need to detox the mind. We know it's more than just physical ailments. It's, it's mind, spirit. It's that whole ethereal thing that goes with it. So this is something I came across. Are, are we doing things like meditation, gratitude? Are we aware of our thoughts? I love this thing with this power word focus. I didn't even realize this till I, I read this. And it's, it's, it's quite an interesting exercise 
to do that, where you take one word and you just focus on that for, for the day about one of these things, love, hope, confidence, it could be anything. But are we really taking care of ourselves mentally? So we, again, we're going to talk a whole heck of a lot about physical detox, but I don't want you to lose sight of detoxing the mind and detoxing the spirit. So here's, a, here's just a general approach to detox. If you're, you're talking to someone, what, what is their history? What, what could they possibly have been exposed to? They work in a factory, they work on a farm. You know, what, what type of work did they do? Because that, that gives you a lot of history. We can do specific toxicological testing if indicated. We can remedy biochemistry if we identify it. Most important is we've got to get them on good diet and supplements. And my favorite thing is regular sweating with exercise or sauna. You're, if you're a sauna fan, you're going to hear a lot of that from me today because sauna is a great way to detoxify the body daily exercise. And then again, as if we identify certain toxicants, then we'd use directed therapies. So again, it's, we can start simple and then we can get complex as we see. So when we talk about detoxification programs, this can be a single process. It could be a variety of approaches. One size does not fit all when it comes to this. Simple detoxification is fasting. Other detoxification is a juice cleanse. I'm not always a favor of that, but again, a way to do it. We can eat only certain foods. I think that's a, that's a little bit remedial for some of the things we do, but certainly a great start. We know that we can use certain supplements and other commercial products to help with detoxification. And a very simple thing is using herbs. Herbs are on this earth to really help us detoxify. There's nothing better than using fresh herbs as a because they really like to bind on to some of the things that get us into trouble. Now, let's get a little more advanced. What do we, you know, now we hear about cleansing the colon. They do this with coffee enemas. They do it with laxins, laxatives and colon hydrotherapy. I'm not against all this, but this really needs to be done with guidance. There's too many people just sort of experimenting and you can harm yourself. We also need to reduce any environmental exposure if we identify it. And again, let's go back to our friend, the sauna. Leo and I were chatting about this before, how important sauna is daily sweating to detoxify the body and, and get some of the things out of the pores, getting that lymphatic system to work appropriately. Okay, now let's get into the little more advanced here. Let's talk about what can we use what is in our toolkit or what can I put in my toolkit if we identify certain toxins? What can I do to help rid myself of that? Most common area is this area of binders. Binder is, is a substance or a supplement that is trying to bind onto the, to the toxin to help you eradicate from it. So common binders, cholestyramine. This is really used quite a bit in lime and mold. Cholestyramine was an older drug used for reduction of cholesterol, but it has great, great binding qualities. So again, it's, it's a great way to think about doing things. Fulvic acid, humic acid, you see this, or zeolite, you see this a lot. Again, these are natural clays that again, go in and sort of adhere to these fat soluble toxins and can bind onto them. Charcoal, I mean, I, again, I'm an ER doctor by trade, we gave charcoal years and years to try to bind things, especially in overdoses, but simple charcoal can be a binder. And then we can now get into the most simplistic, which is using chlorella. Chlorella, spirulina, these natural al al algaes, very easy to take, very mild, little bit at a time. For some people, this is really one of the best ways to go because this, it's the intense detox, as we'll talk about later, that becomes difficult. So we can start small. We can start with just a little bit of binding if they're not healthy and just start to get, can, can we get some of this toxic load down? So we have pretty common things that are available. The only one of these that is available by prescription is cholestyramine. So you can get binders through any, any, we have extremely good companies that are doing good work and you can get binders through them. Let's just sort of take this a little bit farther. Now we've bound up the toxins. We've got to get it. The next place we're going to see is going to go to the liver. 
My one of my favorites is using milk thistle. It's antioxidant, it's antiviral, it's anti-inflammatory. It can buy metals, medications. It really is, is really, really good for supporting the liver. When we get these, now we've mobilized these toxins. We ha they have to go to the liver and undergo a, one of the processes that we're gonna use to eradicate them. Milk thistle really supports this. How does it do this? Anytime we increase glutathione or sod or superoxide dismutase, again, we give the body more antioxidants to be to help move this process along because part of what we're going to see is one thing is if you get a hold of a toxin, you have to now eradicate it. And this is we're going to see this is that if you get hold of it and they can't eradicate it, they get ill. So it, we got to use these these things in conjunction to make it a palatable detox. Again, we'll continue on this because glutathione is the most potent antioxidant. Anything that increases glutathione levels really helps you. We can use sulfur-containing foods. This is your brassicas, your alums. That would be onions for most people. Well, again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to scavenge for um, oxidative species and free radicals. And anything that, that helps the liver, the main thing that's most simple is glutathione, and acetylcysteine or MSM. Now we've known MSM for joints for a long time, but again, I like it more in this, in this regard. There are medications, I've used both of them. One is DMSA, the other is calcium EDTA. Again, more critical when we're trying to, or if we have identified a metal toxin. If we identify a metal toxin, this is where these come in. They can use, be used orally, they can be used IV, they can also be used by rectal suppository from a good compounding lab. Again, I, I tend to not do the IV, it's a little, it, it's again, not cost effective. I have used these in suppositories as well as oral and um, can be very efficacious. Again, slow and steady wins this race. So here's, here's some of your detoxification medications. When we talk about detoxification, Let's get in a little bit of the pathophysiology. Again, what we talked about is phase zero. Most toxins are fat soluble. So most toxins will bind up into fat. That's why we tend to think fat is inflammatory. We've got, we, it is now in a lipophilic state. We have to move it into a state where it, it can be conjugated or it can become um, more hydrophilic. So we have to move it into the system. And this is what phase zero does. We, we take this and we move it to the liver. So we, we get it out of the system, into the liver. This is the phase where if the person is not healthy, they will struggle. This is where you get the flu-like illness because you've really increased toxic load. This is the systemic circulation. Then we go into the phase one and phase two pathways. This involves cytochrome P450. We're not going to beat this slide up. We just know that it's got to go down phase one and phase two. So we, we have to have a healthy liver, we have to have a healthy kidney, and we have to have healthy lymphatics because it's one thing to bind toxins, it's another thing to eradicate. If we can't eradicate, the patient gets sicker. So here's our basic detox triangle. Again, we've mobilized this. It's gonna to go to the, li the liver for processing. It's gonna go for the kidney for elimination as well as the lymph system. So lymphatic drainage is really important. And most people, when they get metabolic dysregulation, have poor lymph drainage. So anything we can do, lymphatic massage, there's certain, um, again, supplements and things, homeopathic uh, remedies can help with lymph flow because again, this is, this is taking your immune system, this is taking all of the fluids that are byproducts of, of the body's uh, response to everything and trying to eradicate them. So this triangle has to be intact for you to win. So what is it what does a case history look like? Cuz we want let's now let's get into some more solutions. Typical, what do we do? We take an HPI. We when did it start? Where was I at the time? What things have stressed it or made it worse? What was my diet? What was my lifestyle? What has made it better? What has made it worse? So again, we have to do some investigative work because we know it's out there. It's just the question is who, what, when, where, how? So if we, if we can identify it, then we can, we can attack it. But we need to know what we're up against. If we don't know what we're up against, we're just, 
were just started shooting and shooting, throwing darts at a board. Put together a timeline. When were the beginning of the symptoms? When did they get bad? Again, what things made them worse? Anything make them better? What exacerbated it, right? And then watch out for red flag symptoms, okay? You're gonna love red flags because these are our patients. How many people don't see one of these on their patients? Asthma or respiratory illness that it's unexplained, allergies, unexplained, chemical sensitivity, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. Is These are real diseases that they've now proven that many cases of fibromyalgia have a proven cause. We just never look deep enough. This is where the beauty of functional medicine is that modern medicine misses because we go deeper. We identify and we, we you know, because how many times people come and go, I got fibro. Well, how did you get fibro is the more important thing, right? That's, so again, toxins could be a player in this. Autoimmunity, we discussed it earlier. We're, we're epidemic autoimmune problems now. Brain fog, balance disorder, infertility. Be very aware of this one because I, I didn't start out in my, my career to treat fertility and infertility, but it's amazing the people that seek you out when you have success. So consider this because there's more infertility now than ever. The sperm counts in men are way down. So something to consider. Type 2 diabetes, low testosterone in young men. I can't tell you the number of young men I'm seeing now that come in because their T is low, right? So we have to do more than just say, here, here's some T. We have to investigate how it got there. Thrombocytopenia. Again, these are just some of the red flags. And again, if you look, you will find. Seek and you shall find. So again, here's, here's the classic presentation. There's an immuno component. There's a neuro component. And there's an endocrine component. And I can tell you, when you if you start to look at these, and this is where Laval's triads became really important, they start to go together, right? If you start to have these things going together, you need to now consider, is there some type of toxic exposure? Because this is the patient that has everything wrong with them and can't figure it out. Well, how do we, how do we look for it now, right? This is, can we do some analysis? Are we doing laboratory tests? Are they questions we want to answer? Or do we think there's really something there? Are we fishing or are we really going to find something? All right. Are we testing for metabolites, levels, effects? Are we testing for metabolism? And then what do we know? What is normal and what is, what is toxic? You could have two people with exactly the same toxic load. One has no effects. One has severe effects. And then do we, how do we use these tests to follow up on treatment? Serum is good but it's really good only for acute exposures due to the half-life. And again, everything gets bound into the lipophilic fat or the fat. Urine is great, especially for heavy metals. Again, I'm a more, I'm more, when we talk about provoked versus unprovoked, provoked means we've given them something like DMSA to stimulate some binding so that these things become a little more aware. So I get better answers with a provoked test than an unprovoked, although you can get both. Hair can be used. And then for children, generally fecal. These are some laboratory uh, an anomalies we can see. Again, they're really nonspecific, but again, can help you when you start to see this and question why. I mean, how much decreased cholesterol and triglycerides do we see unless they're super healthy, right? Decreased BUN, that's usually a sign of malnutrition. So increased ferritin we know is a Q-phase reaction. But they're really, unfortunately, nonspecific. So now that we, we've identified a problem, the first thing we have to do is, is the patient healthy or is the patient unhealthy? You do not want to detox an unhealthy person. You can cleanse an unhealthy person, but a detox is more severe and will make an unhealthy person very sick. Do they have the, the triad working, liver, kidneys, and lymphatics? Are we looking at it as a diagnostic issue or therapeutic? How long are we going to do the detox? How severe are we going to do it? Because I've done a detox. It's 90 days and it's miserable. Well, the beginning's miserable, but it's a lot of work. And then do we stage it? Do we do a little at a time and then be more aggressive down the road? So you have to always think about this. You can't just go, I'm going to do one thing and stick with it because it doesn't work for each patient. Here's some simple things. If you just want to do some basic stuff, hydrate your body, supports digestion, lymphatic system, eat clean food. It's like, we can't talk about this enough. Try to use non-toxic personal 
products, try to limit your environmental toxins. That's very difficult. Get your sweat on, sauna, daily exercise, and then make deep sleep a priority. This is the fundamentals of integrative medicine right there. So I'm going to conclude there because Leo told me I had to move quickly. I'm, um, hopefully I've uh, tried to take you through this journey. And what I really wanted you to do is now gain an awareness that some of these people that you're struggling with may have another problem that needs to be identified. This is um, my final slide. I, I appreciate your time. If you need to ask me questions or want to get in touch with me, these are all uh, the ways to do it. Email is generally the best. And again, I really appreciate access for giving me the opportunity to go through a, what I consider a very timely and unfortunately a very scary topic. Dr. Ferris, excellent presentation, sir. We uh, thank you as well. Um, I personally feel like I need a I need a detox of my own, of the mind, of the body, of the spirit. Now, right? You've really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, I have a few questions uh, that were submitted via the Q and A. So the first question is, what is what is the first step? Right? Um, I know you mentioned detoxing healthy individuals only. Um, and diagnosing unhealthy individuals. Um, but what is the first step that you take when you have a new patient, healthy patient that wants to undergo detox? What questions do you ask, um, if any? Right. And again, we, we have to look at the severity of the problem. So is, is the problem, again, all these people are affected. So again, I go back to my basic things. Is this patient healthy enough? Do I need to do something very gentle? Do I need to do something very simple, like just maybe giving them some chlorella and asking them to do some infrared sauna and start there and see how they do? The other thing I will do is a lot of times I will use, and again, I'm not allowed to mention products, but we use certain um, week-long sort of cleanses. And the, the response to a cleanse is an eye-opening thing. If a patient loses eight to 10 pounds, which is not unlikely, um, you really have a toxic burden is, that needs to be identified. Excellent. And I know you just mentioned you're, you're not supposed to mention brands. Um, I do have a, uh, a question here. Are there any binders that you personally use and recommend? I know you can mention brands. Um, I know you mentioned uh, Milk Thistle is one of them. So again, milk thistle really helps the liver. I, I really like charcoal because it's pretty inert. I really like the fulvic acid because they're gentle. So I, I usually tend to go with the very simple things until I, I know how the patient's going to respond. If the patient can respond well, then I can start to push the accelerator a little bit and go to something more. I mean, it's cholestyramine, again, unless they're very, very sick, um, should not be first-line therapy. Excellent. Now, okay, let's say you you have your patient on on this new path of detox, right? What do you do to ensure? Is there anything that that you can do rather to ensure that they stay on this path of detox as soon as they walk out of your office? Well, what you're hoping for is they feel better, right? I mean, th that's the end result of anything. I always ask. And I always, I, I love to, this is the only thing I argue with modern clinicians about, ask them what their quality of life is. Has your quality of life improved after what we did? Do you feel clearer of the mind? Do you feel lighter in your body? Okay. Unfortunately, we can't measure that, but that's a very salient point that I like to use because if we're making progress and then we just kind of reiterate, we're doing really well, it, it just helps me set up what, and again, this was talking about the staging. We start slow and we can pick up speed down the road, but I need to make sure there's responsiveness. I need to make sure there's buy-in because if patients don't feel they're getting well, they won't move to the next level. Agree. Concept. Agree. Fair enough. Uh, th this is a very interesting question. <laughs> what do you believe has attributed to the low T in this generation of young men compared to previous generations? Um, it, I, I'm going to tell you my gut feeling is xenoestrogens. All the estrogenic compounds that we are now exposed to over time that now 
we're getting such an estrogen load. And I, I mean, I could, you know, my favorite story is the one about the craft beer and why there was so much gynecomastia and they couldn't figure it out. So they realized everybody was drinking so much craft beer, so much estrogen exposure. Wow. That's my, that's my gut feeling. I think we'll get, I think it'll get rooted out in the next five to 10 years. Excellent. Um, so I'm, uh, I'll be frank. I am, uh, I obsess with, with, with this. Um, so I, I'm very fond of this question. I personally go into the sauna 30 minutes every morning and then 30 minutes before I go to sleep. All right. I am a, I am a different type of a, a case. All right. So let's say for the regular average person, how much sauna exposure do you recommend? Do you recommend uh, daily? That is a fabulous question. I'm going to, I'm going to answer it. If you look at the study done out of Finland, and that's where they do more, more sauna than anything else. It was 15 to 18 minutes, three times a week. That's okay. a doable thing. If you want more, you do more. But I'm saying if you want to see clinical research that proof of concept, sauna 15 to 15 to 18 minutes a week, three times or three times, 15 to 18 minutes a day or three times a week was more than sufficient. It, it lowered blood pressure, it lowered cardiovascular disease risk. We know, so we know it's going to do the same thing for toxins. Excellent. Excellent. And now my last question, um, how much sleep do you recommend? Boy, more than I get now. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we should all shoot for, for, for eight hours. Now, if you follow sleep cycles and you know that sleep cycles go every 90 minutes, then optimum is somewhere between seven and a half and nine. Right. But it's really not the total time of sleep. It's the quality of sleep. Again, I, I was part of a big whoop study where we looked at this and it wasn't the total time in bed. It was how much REM sleep did I get and how much slow wave sleep did I get? So it's the quality of sleep, not necessarily the quantity. Excellent. OK. And now, Dr. Ferris, before we wrap up, I actually have one more question that popped up in the Q&A. Um, do you work with individuals? I know you provided us with all of your contact information, which is on the screen right now, uh, for those who want to take a picture of it or uh, type, take it down. Uh, but do you work with uh, people virtually? And by yes. people, okay. Yes, Excellent. absolutely. That's, uh, again, since COVID, that is really, um, because how many people have access to someone who has knowledge, right? And experience. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm the, but this is what I found is people will seek you out you know, again, I have to thank the Pam Smiths and the Jim Lavals and all those people in the world because they taught me everything. That is excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And again, thank you. Very, a very, very informative lecture. Um, very educational. Access and myself, I'd like to thank you again for your time. Uh, thank you to the audience for joining us. Again, if you want to come in contact with uh, Dr. Ferris, all of his information is on the screen. I've known Dr. Ferris personally for I think close to a decade at this point. At least a decade, um, Leo. At least a decade. We've Given been fighting about battle for a decade. Giving away my age, yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you again, Dr. Farris. As oh, always. my pleasure. I hope, I hope everybody got something out of this. Excellent. Absolutely. Thank you to the audience. Until next time.